the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The passage of scripture that I just read from the Gospel of Luke is usually referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. And mostly, I think, when we hear prodigal, we associate it with the son who went off and engaged in a wayward life. And so we might think that the word prodigal has something to do with that. But in fact, it doesn't. The word prodigal comes from the Latin word that means lavish or extravagant or excessive. And if you think about the story and its context, I think you, you may agree with me that it wasn't just the second son who was uh, lavish or extravagant or excessive. There's a strain of excessiveness that runs through this entire story. It's a pretty strong reaction for the younger son to say, I'm tired of living here. I'm, let me go. Get, give me my share of the inheritance. And, and, a, and, I, and I'm off. And then he goes and spends the income that ha has been given to him in admittedly a lavish, extravagant, excessive way. Then he sinks in a kind of uh, excessive way into a kind of poverty that makes him reconsider his choices. And he decides to come back to be with his family not presuming, at least he didn't say so, to come back and inhabit the position that he left as a second son. He was willing to come back and be the equivalent of the father's staff, the father's servants and slaves. And I think you might be able to imagine that the father in this story also reacts in a way that is lavish, extravagant, maybe a little bit excessive. As soon as he sees him coming, he sets in motion this magnificent feast of welcome that includes uh, special clothing and special music and a uh, special feast, something apparently not a kind of thing that typically happened in this household. And he encounters his son without any uh, desire for an explanation about what brought him back. He heard what the second son has to say, but it's almost irrelevant. The point for the father is that the son has come back, and in his effusive love and his relief of this return, he does this amazingly extravagant thing. So at least these two people are lavish, extravagant, and excessive. Most people give the older son a pass on this because they kind of have been in similar situations where it seems like some, usually people who have lots of brothers and sisters, they think that uh, somehow uh, you have to keep an eye on how many benefits each one gets because of, above all other things, we want to be fair in, in our family life. And clearly giving this brother his share of the inheritance, having him waste it and having him come back and have this big party is not really fair. And so the older brother also acts in a way that is uh, at the very least, uh, fraught with emotion. And that, that's the thing that I want us to hold in our minds and hearts as we reflect on this story. It's not just the second son who is in a state of heightened emotions in this story. Everybody is. And Jesus tells this story in a context that is heightened with emotion. Jesus is in the midst of his ministry to sinners and tax collectors, people who are not supposed to belong. 
And the Pharisees are pretty upset about it. They're grumbling, Luke says. They're grumbling. And Jesus tells this story in that context of heightened emotion and anxiety about who is doing the right thing, what it means to do the right thing, what's the right way to respond to people who are doing the wrong thing, how far can we be expected to forgive. And I don't know of any time in my recent life when that kind of emotional context seems more apt for the life that we're living today. We're living in a time of heightened emotion where there is real concern about what people are doing and how they're doing it. And real debate in our minds and in our hearts and in our communities and among nations about what to do about that. What to do when we think that someone has transgressed a boundary. How far we can go before we're willing to forgive. And in fact, the kinds of experiences that we have in the intimate circle of our own families and among our friends extends well beyond that little circle into the way that we as citizens of the world react with people across the globe. So when Jesus tells this parable in the midst of a time of anxiety, when people weren't sure what to do and were quick to take sides and quick to be stuck in a certain posture. He tells a story that emphasizes in the first place that being anxious and having strong feelings about these things is perfectly normal. And this parable is about how the kingdom of God works. There's a lot of emotion. And it, Jesus also wants us to hear in this story, I think, where it is that that emotion, that lavish, extravagant, excessive way of reacting to the things around us brings healing and reconciliation, and when it contributes to further misunderstanding and harm to the people around us. Because in the story, we hear both. There's both a desire to bring people together and be reconciled, and there's a resistance to that. And that's all part of the world in which we live. As we try to make sense of this story in our own lives and in the lives that we take from here out into uh, the world, into our ministries, as we ponder this story in the context of the events that are surrounding us in our nation and in, uh, among the nations. I hope that you will pay attention to the part of the story that we often forget, which is that the father in the story seems to assume that there's always enough. It might not be fair, that the second son got a lot of money and went off and squandered it. Because there's always more. With God, there is always more. There are always more opportunities to be reconciled. There is always more hope, although we don't always see it. St. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, calls upon the faithful followers of Jesus to be ambassadors for Christ, to be reconcilers. And if we want to be reconcilers, I think it's really important for us to focus in on that one part of the story. The father's sense that there is plenty to go around and that the people who were always with him will continue always to be with him. They're not losing a single thing by giving something to someone else. Even if that person didn't treat his previous property very well, even if he doesn't deserve it. We don't get things, we don't give things in the kingdom of God because we deserve them. No one deserves them. We give them to each other 
because we want to live together in love. And living together in love, being ambassadors for Jesus, means bringing down that level of anxiety and reaction to the things that are going on around us and kind of settling into this sense that any one of us could be the second son at a particular time in our life, or we could be the first son, or we could be the father, or we could be the slave, or we could be the goat or fatted calf. We could be the pigs. This story has a lot of different ways for us to enter into the story. And what ultimately matters is not who all of those people are, it's how they chose to come together to be reconciled. And it's an unfinished story. We don't know what the first son did. Did he kind of relent and join in the party? Did he stomp off for a while and sulk? Did he say, okay, we can do this, but next week we're gonna have another party for me and my friends with the goat? We, we don't know what happens, but we do know that Jesus' intention in telling the, us this story is to give us resources to understand how we relate to each other, to give us a sense of our own need to be forgiven and to be reconciled with one another, and our own desire to love each other even when there are barriers. It's when we pay attention to those things settle into this place where we know that God is going to provide what we need to make the offer to love and be reconciled with our neighbors, that that can actually happen. That's where the hope is. That's where the love is. And I pray that each of us will take this story to heart and carry those words out into the world, out into the relationships that we have with our families and our friends, the people with whom we work, bearing these things in mind when we're making political decisions, when we're feeling frustrated that things aren't going the way that we want them to go. Come back to that place of abundance, that place of desiring forgiveness and reconciliation. And there's no better way to be an ambassador for Jesus, a reconciler, than if we're able to do this, those things. I commend that calling to each one of you and pray that we all have the strength and wisdom and support that we need to accomplish it. Amen.